Hello, everyone, and welcome to History Cop. My name is Ray Johnson, and in this episode, we're going to be talking about one of my favorite topics of Chicago history, and that's the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition. Now, we can't talk about the whole exposition. It would take hours and hours and hours, and we're going to try to keep this to about a 10-minute video. Um, but what we're going to talk about specifically, uh, and the reason we're talking about the Columbian Exposition specifically, is most of you recognize the Chicago City flag. Uh, it's actually behind my head, but my big head's in the way, so I decided to put it up on the screen. Uh, the Columbian Exposition was so important to the city of Chicago that it's actually represented by the third star in the Chicago flag when you look left to right. The first star represents Fort Dearborn. The second star represents the 1871 Great Fire. The third star represents the Columbian Expo. And the fourth star represents the 1933-1934 uh, Centuries of Progress uh, World's Fair. And, um, and we're going to talk specifically about a certain event that happened uh, at the Columbian Exposition. And most people, if you ask them which Chicago fire of the 19th century was responsible for uh, the most number of Chicago firefighters' death, most people would say the, the Great Fire of 1871. And that's just not the case. Uh, the fire we're going to be talking about is the fire that happened on July 10th, 1893, during the Columbian Exposition. And it happened at the Cold Storage Building. And in keeping with the uh, tradition of History Cop, we're not just going to talk about um, the history of the fire, uh, the Cold Storage Fire, but we came across uh, an unidentified, uh, unknown, previously unknown victim of the fire, uh, whose name does not appear on the uh, memorial at Oakwood Cemetery. The 1893 World's Columbian Exposition, or White City as it became known, was a monumental part of Chicago's history. It is hard to believe that Chicago was chosen to host a celebration of the 400th anniversary of Columbus discovering the New World only 19 years after the city was virtually burned to the ground in 1871. The eyes of the world were fixed on the spectacle for the six months that it was open from May 1st until October 30th of 1893. The fair was nearly 700 acres and had over 200 buildings, with every state and territory in the United States represented, along with 51 nations and 39 colonies of the world. The 14 great buildings alone housed over 65 million square feet of floor space. The largest building, the Manufacturer and Liberal Arts Building, was large enough to house 23 football fields. Southwest of the Grand Court of Honor stood an obscure concession building known as the Cold Storage Building. It was just east of Stony Island Avenue and just south of the 64th Street entrance to the fair. It stood roughly in the same place as the current Jackson Park Fieldhouse at 6401 Stony Island. It wasn't an exhibit building per se, even though it had an ice skating rink open to the public on its top floor. The Cold Storage Building was owned and operated by the Hercules Iron Company, whose works were in Aurora, Illinois, and whose offices were in the Owings Building in Chicago. They had the exclusive contract to supply ice and cold storage for other vendors and fairgoers. The building itself was 150 feet wide and 250 feet long. It was six stories high and had four observation towers on the corners, with a 190-foot smokestack running up the middle. The north third of the building was used for cold storage, while the south third was where the ice freezing tanks and company offices were. In the middle were the boilers, coreless engines, and three 120-ton Hercules ice-making machines that fairgoers could see in operation. Initially, the almost 200-foot-tall black iron smokestack was visible from the Court of Honor in stark contrast to the glistening white of the White City and Daniel Burnham, director of works, was not thrilled. He asked that the smokestack be covered up somehow, but really wasn't very specific in his request, and plans were approved for a wooden structure that would surround the smokestack. Near the top, the distance between the stack and the wooden enclosure was only three feet. The entire structure, including that of the building, was covered in staff, which was a form of plaster and fiber, and then painted white to give the illusion of stone. Fire Marshal Murphy was heard saying that the fire department was going to have problems with this building and that it was a death trap. Security and safety at the fair were a primary concern for the managers of the fair. 
So much so that the fairgrounds had their own security force made up of 2,000 Colombian guards, a large detail of Secret Service headed up by former Chicago Police Inspector John Bonfield, and the Colombian Exposition Fire Department, which by the time of the opening of the fair was reorganized by the Chicago Fire Department under Chief D.J. Sweeney. The fire department had at its disposal a fireboat nicknamed the Fire Queen that was moored near the electricity building, seven engine companies, each with a chemical truck, and two hook and ladder companies. The various companies made up the 14th Battalion, headed up by Assistant Fire Marshal Murphy and headquartered at the service building. Chicagoans who financed the fair very much wanted to at least break even financially, and there was much public pressure on fair organizers to cut back on spending, and many of those cuts were within the Colombian Guard. Many believed that paying over 2,000 guards was overkill, and prudent cuts could be made without sacrificing safety. One of the guards cut was the one tasked with manning a handheld extinguisher and putting out small fires around the smokestack at the cold storage building, which had three small fires previous to the final one. On July 10, 1893, at 1.32 p.m., the first firefighters arrived in response to an alarm. A small fire could be seen in the dome or lantern section of the tower near the top of the smokestack. The first men to arrive could not get the fire equipment through the east entrance of the building because of a 12-foot metal statue of Christopher Columbus that was blocking the doorway. They had to tie ropes around the statue and pull it down. They took up ropes through a small internal access in the smokestack involving the use of ladders that were permanently mounted to the insides of the tower. Within 15 minutes, nearly 20 firefighters had scaled the outside of the tower through the use of cleats and made their way to the balcony just below the fire. They pulled up hoses with the use of ropes and started to shoot water on the flames directly above them. There was a roar of applause from the crowd of approximately 30,000 spectators who stood by to watch this unplanned demonstration of firefighting expertise. Suddenly, fire erupted through the walls of the tower below the firefighters. Hot embers had made their way down between the gap in the smokestack and enclosure and had the firefighters trapped. Within seconds, firefighters were forced to evacuate by any means necessary. The first firefighter to escape slid down one of the hoses through what looked like an impenetrable wall of fire. He emerged from the flames with his clothes on fire but still clinging to the hose. He made it down to the roof and down a ladder to safety. His name was John Davis of Engine Company 6, stationed on the Midway Plaisance. Many times, seconds are the only difference between life and death in a fire like this, and many of the remaining men were not so lucky. There was an eerie silence when the people below could see the firefighters hugging one another, and one by one jumping and falling through the roof, which was already starting to be consumed by fire. The roof itself was merely pine planks covered in tar and gravel, held up by pine 2x4 joists, which snapped easily under the weight of the falling men, sending them into the fires below. Captain James Fitzpatrick, who was temporarily assigned to Engine Company 2, an assistant battalion chief, remained on the tower for as long as he could in an effort to give his men the best opportunity to escape. He could not convince the last man to jump, so he grabbed a burning rope, which was now only about 20 feet long, and swung himself as far as he could to the north side of the roof, which was not completely engulfed yet. Fitzpatrick was a true fighter, he himself a veteran of many fires, who also came from a family of fighters with two brothers who fought in the Battle of Gettysburg in the Civil War. Just then there was a large explosion inside the tower and the entire structure came crashing down with one poor soul still left at the top. Fitzpatrick fell partially through the roof but not completely. He had broken both of his legs and was trapped under a portion of the fallen tower. His hand was inside a hole in the roof and was burned completely off by the time a couple of his men reached him. Fitzpatrick was rushed to the fair's emergency hospital, where he later died of his injuries. In total, 15 persons were killed in the fire. Four Chicago firefighters, eight firemen hired by the Columbian Exposition, and three civilians. A coroner's inquest was started in an attempt to identify the charred bodies that were being recovered at about one every 15 minutes. 800 Colombian guardsmen were not enough to hold back the crowds of onlookers and 45 U.S. soldiers with bayonets were required to assist in order to give recovery workers safe room to work. 
Following the coroner's inquest, which was mainly impaneled in order to identify the bodies rather than determine cause of death, recommended that four persons be held to the grand jury to face criminal negligence charges. John B. Skinner and Charles A. McDonald of the Hercules Iron Works Company, Fire Marshal Edward Murphy, and the World's Fair Director of Works himself, Daniel Burnham. Meanwhile, the World's Fair had dedicated the following Sunday, July 16th, as Heroes Day, with all admission money collected that day going to a fund to assist the families of the fallen. Lost in the fire were Captain James Fitzpatrick, Chicago Fire Department, Engine Company 2, Assistant Chief of the 14th Battalion, age 54. Ralph H. Drummond, Superintendent of the Harder Electric Company, age 27. William H. Denning, World's Fair, Hook and Ladder No. 8, age 33. Lieutenant John H. Freeman, World's Fair Engine Company 1, age 45. John C. McBride, Driver, World's Fair Engine Company 8, age 33. Louis J. Frank, Fireman, World's Fair Engine Company 2, age 30. Lieutenant Charles W. Purvis, Truckman, Chicago Fire Department, Hook and Ladder No. 4, age 28. Paul W. Schroeder, Driver, World's Fair Department, Engine Company 2, age 22. John A. Smith, Driver, World's Fair Department, Engine Company 2, age 26. Captain James A. Garvey, Chicago Fire Department, Engine Company 1, age 32. Norman M. Hartman, Electric Light Lineman, age 24. John Cahill, Truckman, World's Fair Department, Engine Company 8, age 37. Philip J. Breen, Truckman, World's Fair Department, Chemical Engine Company 14, age 26. Bernard Murphy, Boilermaker, age 25. And Captain Burton E. Page, Chicago Fire Department, Light Truck Number 15, age 33. Meanwhile, memorial and burial plans were being made. Many of the firefighters who were identified had families that took care of burial arrangements at various cemeteries across the state, including St. James of the Sag, Rose Hill, Waldheim, Calvary, Concordia in Forest Park, Mount Olivet, and cemeteries in Chatsworth and Springfield, Illinois. Six victims were unable to be individually identified. Among those were Captain Garvey, Norman Hartman, Captain Page, John Cahill, Philip Green, and Bernard Murphy, and were buried in a plot paid for by Oakwood Cemetery and personally chosen by Daniel Burnham. A simple granite marker adorned with a single Chicago firefighter's helmet sits just southwest of the Oakwood's Memorial Chapel and marks their burial location. On the monument are listed the 15 names of the heroes. I had taken a trip to Oakwood Cemetery and spoke to the cemetery office about the monument. They provided me with a plot card showing the locations of the unidentified victims of the fire, but something literally didn't add up. The plot card showed seven unidentified victims when there should only be six. So who was the seventh victim? A check of the Cook County Coroner's records revealed that there was indeed one victim identified only as unknown man that was found within the debris. Very little was mentioned in the press, although I did find a couple of blurbs. There were a number of possibilities regarding the identity of the charred remains, but none panned out, which brings the official death toll to 16. The grand jury concluded that no charges would be filed against Chief Murphy, the owners of the cold storage building, or Daniel Burnham. The report was read on August 5, 1893, with few people present, no comment, and the jury was discharged immediately. The metal statue of Columbus that stood at the east entrance of the cold storage building was salvaged from the debris and its owner, William Hardy Mullins of Salem, Ohio, wished to donate it as the official memorial at Oakwood Cemetery, but the statue violated marker regulations of the cemetery. Instead, he donated it to Chief Kenyon of the 12th Battalion who had actually helped fight the blaze, and the statue was erected in front of Engine Company 51's quarters at 6345 South Wentworth which was the battalion's headquarters. The firefighters of Engine Company 51 proudly displayed the statue and kept it well maintained through the years until Company 51 closed its doors. It was then stored in the fire department maintenance shop for many years until it was refurbished and displayed at City Hall on October of 1993. It was then moved to the 911 Center on Madison Street and finally in 2001 it found its home at the Fire Museum of Greater Chicago 
where it proudly stands as the only remaining relic of the World's Columbian Exposition cold storage fire. Now, if you're a history nut like me, and especially if you're a cemetery nut like me, uh, you owe it to yourself to go uh, visit Oakwood Cemetery uh, and see the fire memorial for yourself. Uh, they also have um, the grave sites of Jesse Owens, uh, the famed Olympic athlete from the 1936 Olympics, uh, Chicago's Mayor Harold Washington, and many, many others. They actually have uh, one of the largest uh, or the largest Confederate burial sites in the northern United States. Very interesting place. Uh, they're located at 1035 East 67th Street uh, in Chicago. Uh, their hours are 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. And you can get a hold of them by phone at area code 773-288-3800. Now, another great place uh, is the Fire Museum of Greater Chicago. Uh, this is a, a hidden gem of Chicago history. And if you are at all interested in the history of the Chicago Fire Department or have a relative who is a member of the Chicago Fire Department, uh, they are located at 5218 Southwestern Avenue. And again, that's the Fire Museum of Greater Chicago. Uh, they're only open the fourth Saturday of the month, and uh, they are open from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So it's a small window of opportunity. Their next uh, open house is February 25th. And uh, however, if you want to do research there, if you want to contact them and make an appointment, uh, you can get a hold of them at uh, area code 877-225-7491. And you can also get a hold of them online at firemuseumofgreaterchicago.org. Uh, thank you again for uh, visiting us here at History Cop, and we look forward to producing more videos about the great history of the city of Chicago and its surrounding areas. Hey, if you like videos on Chicago history, make sure you hit the little button that says subscribe at the bottom of the screen. It'll make me really happy and it'll probably give you a warm fuzzy too.